We are recording this interview on Friday, March 4th, 2022. I mention this because by the time you see this program, things may have changed enormously. Already the Russian invasion of Ukraine has taken some unpredictable turns with many, many more to come. I think that we've all been shaken by what's happening thousands of miles away in our living rooms, but certainly nobody should be more shaken than my guest. Lubomir Luchuk is Professor of Political Geography in the Department of Political Science and Economics at Royal Military College of Canada. Whew. Welcome, Professor. Good afternoon. Shakespeare wrote, Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. History has shown that those dogs, when freed, can be unpredictable. They can bite their masters in the ankles. Has uh, Vladimir Putin bitten off more than he can chew, so to speak? Oh, I think that's pretty evident already. Um, Mr. Putin has brilliantly played the West, or at least at the start, but I do not think he anticipated at all the defiance, the resilience, and the resistance he's encountered all across Ukraine, in every part of Ukraine, from every element of Ukrainian society. Ukrainian soldiers in 2022 are not the Ukrainian soldiers that some of his military faced in Crimea in 2014 or in eastern Ukraine. They are people who have been fighting a war against Ukraine, defending Ukraine against Russia for eight years. So this invasion has run up against very stiff resistance. Uh, Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland, for their families, for everything they hold dear, which is basically a liberal democratic society against the tyranny next door. And so Russian losses have been very high. Uh, somewhere in the order of seven, 8,000 Russian dead already, which is more than the Americans lost in some 20 years in Afghanistan, which tells you how fierce the fighting is. Ukrainians are giving better than they're getting, but of course, tragically, many civilians are dying, being maimed, killed. Over a million people have been forced into neighboring countries as refugees. That number is likely to grow. It's a humanitarian catastrophe, and of course, it's been just overnight, before, you know, before coming in here, I was listening to the reports about how the Russians have now targeted nuclear reactors, uh, unleashing potentially uh, Chernobyl-level disasters in Europe. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Putin has destabilized the, the structures of Europe, the peace of Europe. He's violated the United Nations Charter. He is certainly, by any definition I know, a war criminal. The people who have acted on his behalf criminals themselves, these men and some women, should all eventually end up in the International Court at The Hague to face trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that's a, a view now that I think is becoming quite common among scholars. I, I wrote about that back in June of 2021 and people thought, ah, I was pushing it. But today I noticed the Globe Mail had an editorial or an opinion piece on exactly that point saying that Mr. Putin is a war criminal. I certainly think he is. I think the other thing that uh, he underestimated is just how resolved the world, not only the West, but even small nations now, are doing what little they can. I don't think he, he realized, really thought that we had the stomach to stand up to him, and yet we're doing, even China's going, Whoa, okay, uh, what time is it? And, you know, do you think that he, he had any idea that we'd stand up the way we have? Well, you, you have to remember that Mr. Putin is a creature of his upbringing and of his times. He's a Soviet man, as he would put it. His grandfather was a loyal servant to Stalin. His father was in the NKVD, the Soviet secret police. He was a KGB man. So there's a long family history of, you know, people serving tyrants and serving the Soviet state. When the Soviet Union collapsed, most of the world cheered. Mr. Putin said it was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Most of East Central Europe, the countries that had been part of the Warsaw Pact, the countries that had been part of the Soviet Empire, headed west as fast as they could. People talk about NATO expansion to the east. Rather, it's the east went west. Ask any Pole, ask any Estonian. Now, unfortunately, Ukraine got left out. Ukraine, although it was promised uh, a pathway to NATO in 2008, although it gave up its nuclear arsenal in 1994 and Budapest memorandum, believing that its political uh, sovereignty and integrity, territorial integrity would be protected, was a bit naive. And again, I'll tell you, I remember quite well, and it was the 15th of November, 1991. I wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail where I said to the Ukrainians, don't give up your nuclear weapons, this is a mistake. They did, because they thought that they had guarantees from the West, and actually even the Russian Federation, 
that proved to be, uh, of course, a myth. It proved to be a dream. And now they're suffering for it. Um, yes, the West has finally stepped up. But Canada has been providing uh, weapons, the United States, the United Kingdom particularly, uh, my friends in the Republic of China, Taiwan, mil uh, medical supplies just the other day. Many countries that had formerly been outside of NATO are now talking about joining. Think about Finland, think about Sweden. And of course, Putin has threatened them. Mm. So there has been a, a unification of NATO, of the European Union. The European Union has gone out of its way now to provide military hardware to Ukraine. The doors to the rest of Europe are open for Ukrainians fleeing the fighting as refugees. But, you know, I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, whereas about the end of uh, February, I was writing in the Globe saying that I think Mr. Putin has won the war because he has isolated the Ukrainians, he has intimidated the West, he's taken a piece here, a piece there, and no one's done anything. No one did anything much in 2014. There were some, some sanctions that really didn't do anything. The war's been going on for eight years. The Ukrainians should have been better prepared for this, and they weren't, so it's not just the West's fault. But the, the West has been reluctant to do things like impose a no-fly zone, uh, to put boots on the ground. So it's as if the NATO countries built a cordon sanitaire and said to Ukraine, well, you're on the other side of the wall. Good luck. Here's a few tools to help defend yourself, but we're not getting involved. Well, meanwhile, Putin's been pushing. He's pushing, pushing, pushing. And I think his plan was originally to perhaps see some territory, the corridor to Crimea, for example, uh, to intimidate the Ukrainians, to bluff the West and push them away, and he even talked about roll back NATO to where it was before 1991, which is never going to happen. No one's going to leave the club voluntarily, trust me, particularly after mm -hmm. this. So I thought he'd won. I thought he, about, you know, the end of February, just stay still and you're going to, you've, you've got it. Um, but he kept going. He escalated because in part his troops have performed very, very poorly. Half of them don't know where they are. The prisoners of wars are being caught and being interrogated. And by the way, they're being treated very well. Uh, the Ukrainians are asking him, well, we were on exercise. We didn't even know until we got to the border and they pushed us across. So they have no desire to fight. Uh, they're being killed and injured and captured. The Ukrainians are actually giving them cell phones and saying, call your mother and tell you you're okay. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine has said, mm -hmm. any mother, Russian mother who wants to come get her son is welcome to, but she has to come get them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that people will learn about the war. Now, however, Putin's escalation of the war, I think, means to me that he'll lose the war in the sense that psychologically uh, the Russians have always played this game that Ukrainians are little Russians, we're all, you know, we're, we're brothers, well, maybe Cain and Abel, <laughs> but uh, that's shattered for all time. The peace of Europe has been dramatically undercut, so I'm not sure where Europe goes after this, but I think that regardless of any territorial grains, or even if Ukraine is forced eventually to sue for peace, the world is different, and Putin's historical uh, personage is forever marred. Not that it wasn't already before. He is a killer, and we've all known that. But I think he's lost the war. I, I don't know that the Russian nation uh, will tolerate much more of him after this. Uh, the oligarchs are hurting, and of course, they're hurting where they don't want to be hurt in their pocketbooks. The average Russian who is not guilty of this war, it's a Putin war against Ukraine, is, is suffering. And yet he continues. And the only thing you can sort of get out of this is that he really has this agenda to erase Ukraine from the map of Europe. He said, I want to build some kind of East Slavic, Russian-dominated new state based on Belarus and Russia, or the so-called Russian Federation, and Ukraine. Well, Ukrainians don't want that. Ukrainians aren't Russians. Russians aren't Ukrainians. Belarusians aren't Ukrainians, etc. We're all different. We're all different nations. Different cultures, different languages, different historical experiences. Yes, way back in time, you could say, well, there were common roots. Well, you could say the same about much of Europe. You know, with, uh, the, the roots of Europe are, are shared by many states. But we're not anymore. We're different. Putin's agenda now has become almost genocidal. I'm going to erase Ukraine from the map of Europe. Well, the last time I heard anyone talking like that was some extremists in the near Middle East who said they want to erase Israel, right? That's genocide. Um, we, we've, as, as people, you and I growing up in the 20th century and now the 21st, you know, we understand that slogan, never again. 
Well, guess what? Never again is happening right now. Right now, as you and I see, speak, people are dying, people are fleeing for their lives, nuclear power plants are being shelled, uh, civilians are being targeted. The bombing, which started at first with some precision, is becoming more and more random. Friends I know in Kiev, who I was speaking to literally this morning, uh, are now thinking seriously about having to abandon the city. Mm -hmm. Kharkiv has resisted, the siege of Kharkiv is not going well, and I've been in Kharkiv. The last time I was in Kharkiv, the people at the front desk in a hotel, where you know you usually get people welcoming you and being as charming as they can because they want you to like the hotel, laughed at me because I spoke Ukrainian and they spoke mm -hmm. Russian. You know, They were Ukrainians, but they spoke Russian as a daily language, fine. But they laughed at my Ukrainian, and I, and I laughed back, and we made a little joke of it. It's a very Russophone city. It's a city where many people speak Russian because of historical experiences and so on. It's fighting desperately against the Russian invaders. So all this talk that we used to hear, well, you know, the eastern part of Ukraine is, is Russian, and, you know, these Russians want to be part of the Russian Federation. Well, if they do, why don't they just give up? And again, well, the Russian minority, Putin tried this one. The Russian minority in, in this, these parts of Ukraine was discriminated against and experiencing genocide. Well, then why was there no fighting until February of 2014 in that region? None. I was there. I was, I've been there many times. So this is, it's all made up or that the, the government of Ukraine is somehow Nazis. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. So President Zelensky, whose father fought in the Red Army and who is of Jewish heritage, or the current Minister of Defense or the former Premier, all of who are Jewish heritage, are Nazis? I mean, that, that, there's your stretch. You know, so Russian disinformation picked up a lot of Soviet era propaganda and they keep spreading it. But the fact is, Ukrainians as a nation in all parts of Ukraine are fighting against the Russian invaders. Ukraine did not attack Russia. Russia attacked Ukraine. And so this is not going to be a cakewalk for Mr. Putin and his legions. And in fact, his legions are suffering enormous losses. To me, it's the same thing as people saying, well, Donald Trump is a white supremacist. No, he's a Trump supremacist. And Putin, to me, is, was not a communist, is not a communist. He's a Putinist. He's a cynical user who, in the Soviet era, said, hey, if I, I'm ever going to be king, I have to be part of this infrastructure. And then as soon as it died, he found his ways to continue his own quest to power and wealth and so forth. I'm just curious what you think about that idea. Well, you're quite right. Um, Vladimir Putin was a loyal servant of the Soviet state. I think he was genuinely committed to the KGB, as his father before him and his grandfather were all Soviet secret policemen, basically. He had a career. The Soviet Union collapsed. He had no career. He was a nobody. He was in Leningrad. Uh, but he developed good connections. And when President Yeltsin took over the Russian Federation, the Yeltsin family, which was horribly corrupt, uh, promoted Putin because they believed that he would uh, allow them to retain their wealth, would allow people like them to acquire wealth by basically pillaging the Russian state and its resources, and that he'd be a useful guy. And he played that game very well. Well, Mr. Yeltsin was you know, a debauched kind of individual. His family were corrupt. Uh, and what happened basically is Putin outsmarted them, put his own KGB men in, very well-trained, disciplined, uh, secret policemen. He rewarded them. He sidelined the oligarchs. Yes, you can make your money. Yes, you can steal from the state. But where's my cut? And when some of them rebelled, he destroyed them. The, the, the Yeltsin family was shuffled up off the side. President Putin becomes president, then premier, then he changes the constitution to become president again. He's a president in perpetuity now. Um, and he is one of, if not the richest man in the world. Now, you can say whatever you like about Trump or Justin Trudeau or any leader that you can name. None of them are billionaires because of their service. Well, isn't it estimated that he has a personal wealth of over 200 billion, which is more than Elon Musk, which is more than Bill Gates, which is more than yeah. The list forms uh, here. I, I don't know what his personal wealth is, but it is enormous. And it certainly isn't based on his pension as a KGB colonel, 
as a president of the Russian Federation, premier or president again. I mean, as much as he's been in all those positions, somewhat illegitimately, he didn't get that rich that way. He is corrupt, and as President Biden said, he's a killer. So we're dealing with a man who is acting in his own self-interest. He knows that if he steps out of that chair, he's in trouble. He has a loyal courtier of Confederates who support him. He has oligarchs who tolerate slash support him because they know their benefits are on it. You go to London and you see half of London's been bought up by Russian oligarchs. You look at the, you know, the, the news reports of the enormous wealth and you realize that the Russian state was bled dry for the profit of a few. Many Russians have suffered that. I don't blame the Russian nation for what's happening in Ukraine. And in fact, the bravest of them are standing up and protesting it. But the fact is, they voted that man in and they have not rebelled. What we really need to see is a genuine Russian revolution. Uh, that's what we truly need in that part of the world. And that Russian Federation itself is a construct that needs to be, frankly, dismembered. Um, the Chechens, the Kalmyks, all sorts of other nations are captive within that Russian Federation structure. So I think in the long run, the great beneficiary of this is gonna be President Xi sitting there in the People's Republic of China going, this will be interesting. Okay, three superpowers. Now there's only one or two. Ah, okay, yeah. we can concentrate on the Americans. Well, and the Americans have been very, have very much concentrated on the PRC until now they've been distracted. So in a sense, Mr. Putin, not on, on behalf of Beijing, of course, he would never, that would never happen, but his behavior is in fact strengthening the PRC, Beijing, against the West. Mr. Putin is now increasingly desperate. This is why the savagery of uh, the, the brutality, the barbarism of what he's doing is, is so troubling because it's escalating. Uh, you know, he ultimately, <laughs> he's to the gallows. Whether someone puts a bullet in his head or he's actually brought to the, the Hague, which isn't gonna happen. But or filled full of bullets like the Romanov or strung up, or strung teenage up, daughters. Well, or strung up like the Mussolini he is. Because in fact, you know, everybody likes to say Putler because they can play on the, the Hitler thing. He's no Stalin and he's no Hitler. He's more Mussolini. And that's probably how he should end up. Just um, now, uh, there was one little thing I heard recently. And, uh, you know, and again, we're in an age of disinformation, <laughs> misinformation, sidetracking, so forth. But one of the clever things that I, I heard about recently was that the Ukraine's Ukraine now has a policy that if you defect, if you're a Russian soldier and you defect, we'll give you $40,000 and a um, uh, asylum so that you can settle in the Ukraine and leave behind the war and so forth. And I thought that was brilliant. I don't know how effective it'll be, but if it's true, I thought that was brilliant piece of strategy. I've not heard that, so I, I really can't comment. What I have heard is that and what's particularly troublesome is we have this international legion now being created. Volunteers are going from Georgia, from the United Kingdom, from Canada. I know one who's gone to serve. So we have these international legions being formed and that sort of suggests solidarity on the part of the West with Ukraine in its defense of war. But the Russians are bringing in mercenaries. Mm. And see the difference between a soldier, even a conscript, you take a 19-year-old conscript, you put him in a uniform, you give him basic training, you send him to war. He may be a lousy soldier, but he follows orders. Mercenaries don't. Mercenaries are set in to do nasty things. They're paid and they do what they're told. And the Russians are deploying mercenaries. They had Chechen mercenaries that they sent in about a week ago to kill Zelensky. And uh, unfortunately for those Chechens, they were slaughtered to a man. Mm -hmm. um, they got trapped in a column and it was blown off the face of the earth. There have been three assassination attempts against President Zelensky in five days. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Now, there are Russians surrendering. There are Russians being captured as POWs. I've seen some of the interviews. They're scared, as anybody would be. But the ones who are injured are being treated. They're being fed. They're being given you know, medical attention if they need it, which is remarkable considering. And as I told you earlier, I've seen many of them being given cell phones and told, call your mom and tell her where you are and why. Well, and many of the, the Russian uh, soldiers, the average, and not obviously the career soldiers in the army infrastructure and the, the mercenaries, are conscripts. Absolutely. They were Shanghai, basically. You know, you carried a, an anti-Putin banner and you're given two choices. 
You can go to the gulag and make big rocks into little ones for the next 20 years, or you can go into the army. Which is it? Well, the conscript is, is a problem for the Russian forces because, as you say, their special forces are as good as the Ukrainians. Those are serious troops, both sides, both sides. Um, then there are the mercenaries and the international legions and all the rest of it. And there are, you know, the Minutemen, if you, if you want to call them, like the Azov people and so on. But those are uh, smaller. The, the average Russian soldier is a conscript. The average Ukrainian soldier is a battle-hardened veteran. So when I was in western Ukraine at Yavoriv, where I saw the Canadians who were training uh, the Ukrainians, the Brits, the Americans were all there training Ukrainians, Operation Unifier. And of course, the Ukrainians were training the Canadians because they have real combat experience. When I witnessed that, I saw professional soldiers, soldiers that you know, are going to fight a war in a dynamic way. The trouble with the Russians is they're told, OK, go from A to B to C. Well, so they start at A, okay? They get to B, they get defeated. So then they try to go to C without taking B. So recently you may have heard uh, Russian planes were landing at Ukrainian-held airfields that were supposed to be conquered. So you've got these Russian transport planes coming in full of troops. The airfield's supposed to be secure. It's not. They get blown out of the sky and 100 men die, tragic, you know, well, well I, it's hard for me to feel sorry for them, but they die because B wasn't done, but the Russian military outside of the special forces follows that kind of pattern and they don't have a good logistical. They're, they're a defensive army. They're not an army for movement. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, are much smaller, but much more nimble, much more dynamic. Uh, colonels, captains, majors make decisions. They don't wait for some general in caves to say, that's okay. The Russian army doesn't work that way. So the Ukrainians have outmaneuvered. They have outfought man to man. To get into a city and do that kind of urban warfare, that is disastrous for any army. It just eats up soldiers because every corner there's someone shooting at you. Or and let's hope that uh, they can continue holding their ground. And uh, I wanted to turn uh, focus a little more locally sure. because um, in this world there's a diaspora, obviously, yes. and there are... Um, specifically, there's a lot of uh, Ukrainian, like Ukrainian Ukrainian students. Um, yeah. In Kingston is a big uh, university and college town. Um, and obviously enough, they've got to be frightened. They've got to be, in, Absolutely. you know. Um, tell me a little bit about that and, and some of the initiatives you've taken. Well, as president of the Ukrainian Canadian Club, I got a call from Sophie Kowala, who many of your viewers will know. Sophie told me, hey, we have some Ukrainian students at St. Lawrence. Uh, we need to help them somehow, Lubomir. How can we do that? And I said, so we hold on. We, we must be having some at Queen's, too. I hadn't thought of it. But there is a Ukrainian students club at Queen's. So I reached out to them and a, a Monday, Monday ago, a week ago. We got together with about 75 students at Queen's uh, and from St. Lawrence. And with Laura Coldwell from St. Lawrence, we began talking to them about how we might help them. Because, yes, what happens when my v student visa runs out? Well, thankfully, the federal government's extended that. Um, Mark Gerritsen was present to, to talk to them on, from the House of Commons. Um, Ian Arthur was there as the local MA. MLA Mayor Brian Patterson came and spoke to the students and welcomed them and told them, we'll do our best to take care of you. So the Ukrainian Canadian Club of Kingston, in association with our partners, Beth Israel Synagogue, for example, uh, the mayor, um, the MLA, the MP, we're, 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 this is nonpartisan. We're all working together to try to raise funds uh, to help these students meet whatever needs they might have in the next couple of months until other programs can step in. So people can donate to all sorts of organizations to help Ukraine. We wanted to have a local effort to help students from Ukraine who are here at least over these next few months. People want to donate food and shelter and all the rest of it. We're just going to ask for people to donate money and every single penny will be given to a Ukrainian student, no administration or any of that stuff. It's all going to come in, we're going to sort it out and ask each student, what do you need and why? Yes, fine, here's your money. No questions asked beyond that. Uh, these students are anxious, they're scared, they're cut off from families, loved ones. We need to try and calm them down a little bit, give them some relief, some hope uh, until things do settle out. We're coming up, of course, to Easter, uh, so you know I'll pray for Ukraine, I'm sure you will, uh, but at the same time we have to also tend to the needs of these young women and men who find themselves cut asunder from their country, from their families, from their loved ones by Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. 
I want to turn this personal for a moment. Um, not as a professor, but as a Ukrainian Canadian. When I know that when they moved, it was like up to that I'd been thinking uh, he's not going to do it. No, he can't do it. No, he's just blood. Oh, damn it, he did it. How did you feel when you first heard that the tanks were moving and Ukraine was under assault? As a, as a Ukrainian Canadian rather than a professor and a person sure. who knows stuff. I got a phone call, I was already asleep, and uh, I heard the news. Um, well, <laughs> good shot. Um, <laughs> cried. Uh, <laughs> good one. Um, prayed for my parents' souls. Uh, thought to myself, you know, my parents were refugees. They came because my mother was a slave laborer in Nazi Germany. My father fought the Soviets. They got a second chance in Canada. Canada was generous, gave them asylum. I was born in Kingston. Um, I am what I am because they came and they sacrificed as much as they did. My sister as well, Nadia, becomes a, a school principal. I become a professor. All of that because my parents were refugees and uh, had this opportunity that Kingston and Canada gave them. Uh, in, my, in my academic world research, I studied refugees. I studied that immigration, that sort of called third wave of Ukrainian DPs to Canada. And I sort of met many of the people, the, many of the Canadian Ukrainians who'd been there before World War II who helped rescue the DPs, my parents' generation. I never thought I'd live to see the day where I'd be the guy here in Canada now helping another wave of Ukrainians, of refugees to Canada. This will be the fifth wave. The first was pre-World War One. then you had the interwar, which was mixed political economic, then you had the DPs, my parents, very political, then you had the fourth post-1991 wave, mainly economic migrants and people coming to study and so on, and now you've got this wave, post-214, but particularly post-222, which is going to be quite different and very large. Uh, I, <laughs> I was getting ready for retirement. Uh, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm now going to write some more books and, and enjoy some peace and quiet. And Ukraine is a normal country, which has resumed its place in Europe, 31 years of, of existence as an independent state. And, you know, a new generation born and raised that's free and open and remarkable. Everything very different from what I was when I was a boy. And now we're back into this. It's amazing how we can try to predict the future, but we can't. Uh, we're out of time, I hate to say it, um, because we could talk for a long time and there's a lot of things we could talk about. Maybe we'll get together, see how things roll out and get Absolutely. together in another Anytime couple of like. weeks. Yep. Um, in the meantime, thanks for uh, for coming here at a very difficult time and talking about something very close and well, very I, personal. I wish I could have talked to you about something more pleasant and under better circumstances. Maybe thank someday you for having we me will. And, uh, Pray for Ukraine.